Before we jump into today's story, a quick word about our episodes in early September. As always, we'll still have our weekly episode with a couple differences, mainly to account for the D23 Expo in Anaheim. First of all, next week we will have not one, but two shorter episodes. One will continue our story of Dick Nunes. The other will preview likely announcements we might hear at the D23 Expo. I also then want to push back our monthly news and analysis episode until the Monday after the D23 Expo. There will be newsworthy announcements to unpack from the Expo, and it seems like a far better plan to post our show after that happens. This means that, just for that week, our show will drop on Monday rather than at its usual time on Sunday. So look for it in your feed on Monday, September 12th, probably later in the day. And I know we're still a couple of weeks away from that date, but I also know that there are many people who listen to our show each Monday morning as they drive, walk, or take the subway to work. I want everyone to have a little bit of advance warning. And so next week, look for those two shorter shows. And the week after that, the week of September 12th, Look for our regular show on Monday rather than on Sunday. But today, we're going to take a look at the life of Dick Nunes during the final days of Walt Disney. Walt was drawn to some of his most expansive and most creative ideas during the final days of his life. Ideas that not only reshaped Disneyland and expanded the nature of the Florida Project, but also redefined Dick Nunes' life inside the company. As you recall, when we last left off, Disney had made the big announcement about the Florida project, and Nunes learned exactly how much the company was planning to spend to make the Florida project a reality. A revelation that allowed him to see with a new level of clarity into the largeness of Walt's plans. <music> The months after the official announcement of the Florida Project were some of the most memorable in Nunes' early career, as Disney was front and center yet again in the news. Walt was on TV, he was in the papers, and beyond the Florida Project, Walt announced plans to develop a Disney-owned ski resort in the California Sierras around the Valley of Mineral King. Closer to home, Walt accepted an offer to be the Grand Marshal for the 1966 Pasadena Rose Parade. On the morning of January 1st, before millions of spectators and home viewers, Walt moved down Colorado Boulevard in a white convertible, sitting beside Disneyland cast member Paul Castle, who wore the costume of Mickey Mouse. Behind the car, Mostly arranged onto a float called Our Small World of Make-Believe were two dozen additional characters that Walt had helped create over the length of his career, from the Three Little Pigs to Alice in Wonderland. By this point, even casual observers could see that Walt, with tired eyes and a loose chin line, was aging. He was heavier than he'd been the previous year, with the weight mostly accumulated around his middle. Still the public loved him. Despite his wealth and fame, he radiated the lifestyle of middle America, a person whose moral values reflected the best attributes of the country. As the public learned about the Florida Resort and Mineral King, some looked again to Disneyland to better understand these developments, as the Anaheim Park would serve in ways as a preliminary model for what these other projects would become. With Disneyland in the spotlight again, these months marked another period of closeness between Walt and Nunes. No matter what struggles Nunes had with designers and engineers at WED, he always fell back into his old role as an admiring student trying to learn the secrets of this business from his mentor, Walt Disney. Walt responded to Nunes's interest as it was genuine and deep and likely understood that Nunes, more than anyone else at the park, 
had the ability to carry forth a central part of his vision, to create the type of social environment that made guests feel comfortable and well cared for. In the early months of 1966, Walt moved forward with large plans at Disneyland. Some of these plans involved relocating attractions from the fair into newly designed show buildings in Anaheim, including It's a Small World, the dinosaurs from the Ford Magic Skyway, and eventually the Carousel of Progress. But other projects developed attractions that were uniquely designed for the park. The largest project presently being developed at the park, though, was New Orleans Square with its shops and restaurants, along with Pirates of the Caribbean and the mansion. But Walt was already looking beyond this. Walt explored plans with designer John Hench that would soon gut Tomorrowland and refresh the entire area with new attractions and exhibits. For the previous three years, WED had been focused on the fair, and at the end of the 1960s, WED would be focused on Florida. Walt understood that for the next two years, WED then needed to be focused on large projects for Anaheim. Most months, Walt made one, if not multiple trips down to the park, sometimes visiting on Monday or Tuesday when the grounds were closed to the public, sometimes arriving on the weekend when the park was packed with people. During these months, Nunes walked with him, taking notes on what should be improved and what needed to be fixed. He ate with Walt in a private back room at the Plaza Inn. At times, he sat with him in the studio apartment above the firehouse. The front window looked out onto Town Square, and the back landing overlooked the jungle. If they stood there, leaning against the rail, they could hear jungle boats as they moved down the stretch of water leading to Schweitzer Falls. On some nights, their conversation turned to serious topics. Quote, Walt called me up to his apartment in Disneyland, Nunes said, and he was really happy. He said, Just think, Dick. We own 43 square miles in Florida. That's like getting on top of the Matterhorn and looking seven miles one way and then 11 miles the other. We're going to be able to have our own Disneyland, our own Knott's Berry Farm, our own Marine Land, and a couple cities to boot. Walt closed by saying, we've got all the land to create all the dreams we can ever think of. It was moments like this in which Walt used words like we that Nunes understood he was central to the Florida development. It was also moments like this in which Walt and Nunes' relationship was likely the strongest. For years, Walt had insisted that Nunes see the park from his vantage point, often alluding to the world of film, how rides should be operated as though they were keyed to a script, how cast members should present themselves as though they were dress extras on a soundstage. But now Walt was trying to present the Florida Project from a vantage point that would most interest Nunes. He was explaining how Nunes, with his expertise in operations, might engage himself in this new venture. In this conversation, the Florida Project wasn't primarily an experimental city, nor was it a massive research lab for American companies, nor was it even a set of themed hotels. It was instead a canvas where the company would build the type of experiences that Nunes knew how to manage. It was every imaginable theme park rolled into one. Yet, at times, Nunes still disagreed with Walt as to how Disneyland was being developed. Though neither Pirates nor the Mansion would be ready for the 1966 debut of New Orleans Square, the land would welcome guests into shops and restaurants at the end of July. A private club and executive lounge was also being arranged in the space above the Blue Bayou. At the World's Fair, Walt had noted that many pavilions had exclusive lounges where executives and show sponsors could bring their guests, either to relax or to talk business away from the crowds. 
Walt now wanted to have such a lounge in his park, a place where Disneyland managers could bring business clients and a place where corporate sponsors, such as Carnation, Coca-Cola, and Kodak, could bring their families and guests. This lounge, as it was arranged toward business standards of the mid-1960s, would have a different set of rules than other areas of the park. Specifically, Walt believed that the club should serve liquor, as had those pavilion lounges at the fair. But Nunes quietly objected. Nunes's mind was drawn to systems of uniformity, a set of rules and a behavioral code that could pervasively govern the park. These rules allowed Disneyland to feel like Disneyland rather than some restaurant or dance hall outside the berm. Nunes explained his thoughts about the sale of liquor, believing such a practice would alter the overall mood of the park. He also believed that drinks weren't particularly appropriate for business meetings, especially inside Disneyland. There's a right time and place for liquor, Nunes said. I don't think work is the right place. Walt, a seasoned businessman explained that many business people saw bars as an appropriate place to conduct business talks. He also pointed out that for many executives, there was no significant barriers between their personal lives and their professional ones. When an executive has breakfast, he's thinking about work, and at the end of the day when he's relaxing with friends over a scotch, he's still thinking and likely even talking about work. These people didn't have the same approach to work as an hourly employee, in which the time clock delineated when the person was at work and when they were not. To drive this point home, Walt added, I'm always working. You're not the problem, Nuna said. With this, Walt simply nodded, moving on to the next topic. If it becomes a problem, he said, you have my permission to shut it down. Then Walt gave Nunes a look to indicate that this conversation was over and that this would simply be something to which Nunes would need to adapt. During the spring of 1966, Nunes, along with other managers, organized multiple press events for the opening of new attractions signaling that the frenetic growth associated with Disneyland's early years was, at least for now, part of the park's identity once more. The first new attraction to open was It's a Small World, the same ride that Nunes had overseen at the fair, now shipped back to California. But for the California installation, designers extended the boat flume and added new areas, such as for the Arctic and Pacific Islands. The attraction also had a new sponsor, Bank of America. On Monday, May 30th, Disneyland orchestrated a grand opening ceremony. The event began with a parade on Main Street featuring 500 children from 18 nations dressed in traditional costumes. Some children were arranged into marching bands, others in troops of folk dancers. Walt himself rode in his electric roundabout, a replica of a 1900s curved dash Oldsmobile. At the end of the parade route, he joined a group of children on the ride's center load island. Once there, he and the children added bottled water from the world's ten oceans and seas into the small world flume, mingling the currents of the globe with the currents of the ride. As with Walt's experimental city, this ride, too, was a way to demonstrate how the design tools of Disney amusements could be repurposed towards a higher social goal, an attraction that modeled the beauty of racial harmony through song and figures. At the ceremony's conclusion, 10,000 balloons lifted into the air, cages opened, allowing a flock of peace doves to flap their way home, and a few daytime fireworks blossomed above the structure like chalk drawings magically appearing in the sky. The next attraction to open was Primeval World, a group of 46 animatronic dinosaurs first presented at the World's Fair as part of the Ford Magic Skyway. At Disneyland, they were arranged into a show building with stage areas viewable from the steam train. Some dinosaurs were positioned in a swamp while others were set against a volcano. This attraction wasn't viewed as its own ride, rather as a new area on an existing attraction. 
As such, it didn't have a press preview event. It simply opened on July 1st as a new scenic area on the Disneyland Railroad. The third opening was for New Orleans Square a place that the public relations team described as, quote, the Paris of the American frontier, as though this somehow explained why a southern town from Louisiana was pushed up against a log fort that belonged to the West. To dedicate the area, the park placed jazz bands on stages and balconies so that the narrow streets were filled with music. For the dedication... The park invited the mayor of New Orleans to join Walt as he opened an area that was a Hollywood recreation of his own city. On that day, park attendance was just over 35,000, with many guests interested in seeing Walt and also New Orleans Square. Walt appeared before a pair of microphones on a makeshift stage, along with the mayor, Victor Shiro. In front of the crowd, the mayor expressed his appreciation that Walt had recreated a historic version of his city in California. Then he joked that this new land, just a few acres and an amusement park, cost more than the actual Louisiana purchase. Walt only laughed, saying, shows what happened to the dollar, though he likely knew that the mayor's estimate was not far off. The Louisiana Purchase had cost $15 million, while New Orleans Square at Disneyland, once Pirates was finished, would cost about $13.5 million. The mayor then made Walt an honorary citizen of New Orleans, giving him a certificate and a medal before allowing Walt to step back to the microphone. Dressed in a gray jacket and tie, Walt looked out at the crowd. Around him were hundreds of invited guests, mostly adults, though a few children as well. A few years ago, during such speeches, Walt tended to focus on the wonders his artists and engineers produced, such as animatronic birds and bobsleds that raced through an icy mountain. He had that same opportunity right here to focus on the Pirates attraction that in a few months would join New Orleans Square, or to mention the ghostly residents that would soon inhabit the mansion. But instead, for the entirety of his speech, he focused on the historical representation arranged into New Orleans Square. Disneyland, as you know, is sort of made up of various things that represent our country, he said. He then explained that New Orleans Square was arranged to remind guests about the importance of the Louisiana Purchase. At the start of the 19th century, he explained, America was interested in acquiring the port of New Orleans, which, through negotiations with France, resulted in a land purchase that doubled the size of the United States, giving America control of territory that stretched from the Gulf of Mexico up through the Midwest and ending at the Canadian border. Again, he chose to frame his discussion about amusements in a way that highlighted how such experiences might improve society, this time by representing history. He concluded by saying, That's what New Orleans Square means in this land of Disneyland. Now I want to show the mayor around our New Orleans, see how clean we keep the streets. That's what I like. To many in the park, it was clear that Walt's voice was changing. After a lifetime of smoking, his speech was becoming low and rough, with a little gravel mixed in to the lower syllables. For those who only saw him on TV, they also noticed that Walt's hair was decidedly grayer in person, his skin more like that of an older man. He looked thinner as though he had recently lost weight. Still, he was enthusiastic, upbeat, clearly enjoying himself as this new area opened to the public. After the ceremony ended, Walt stayed in the park visiting shops with the mayor and walking through the lovely alleyways that had been designed by some of his best artists. After this event, however, Walt would slowly withdraw from Disneyland, giving the impression to those who worked there that he was fading away from the park he so loved. He came back to Disneyland early that fall for a photo shoot arranged before the castle. He returned once, maybe twice, to walk through New Orleans Square and observe how the restaurants and stores were developing.
Managers at Disneyland, including Nunes, now saw Walt more regularly on TV hosting his weekly show than they did walking down Main Street. For them, Walt's absence was a noticeable change. At the studio and at WED, Walt's new passion was that experimental city, a project that he now called Epcot. He'd established a room where a few key designers explored plans to transform urban living using the type of research skills and site planning that years earlier they had used to transform the popular concept of an amusement park into Disneyland. He was taken with this project, same as he had been taken with Disneyland in the mid-1950s and with Snow White in the 1930s. Still, Walt must have known that something was wrong, that his body was beginning to betray him. He found that he couldn't walk across the lot without coughing. He woke up at night with an ember of pain centered around that vertebra he'd injured years ago while playing polo. He may have believed that he might need to temporarily step away from his role as the creative head of Walt Disney Productions, or he may have sensed that his problems were far more dire. Regardless, he insisted that writers and artists develop a 30-minute film that defined his vision for Epcot, a film that, if necessary, could stand in for him if he was unable to make an important presentation, though, of course, he never discussed the possibility that he might not be able to fully guide this new project into existence. Each afternoon, he sought the care of studio nurse Hazel George, who eased his back with massage and infrared treatments, while he sipped a scotch mist and talked about his day. He looked at scripts. He discussed story elements for The Jungle Cruise. He reviewed edits for The Happiest Millionaire, a musical that was, in ways, the follow-up to his 1964 hit Mary Poppins, a period musical with songs penned by the Sherman Brothers. Most importantly, he read books about city planning that refined his vision for Epcot. The pain in his upper back, though, was becoming significant, preventing him from sleeping most nights. His personal doctor referred him to a specialist. From there, Walt consented to a surgical plan that ideally would ease the symptoms stemming from the calcified area in his spine. Doctors believed that this damaged vertebrae through motor nerves was likely connected to the trouble he experienced with his right leg. It lagged slightly as he walked. This, too, could be improved with the same operation. Press writers at the studio prepared for his absence, a period of recovery that might last somewhere between two weeks and two months and arranged a press release that explained that Walt, due to a spinal injury, was undergoing an elective surgery. The release advised that he was in the hospital for a, quote, treatment for a neck injury. The 64-year-old executive had received while playing polo. To prepare for surgery, doctors ordered a set of exploratory x-rays focused on the region of his neck and back where they would operate, hoping to identify exactly what needed to be done. Only once the images were screened by a radiologist, they discovered that Walt had a far more serious concern than an injured vertebra. They saw a cluster of dark spots around his lungs, images that often indicated cancer. The size of these spots suggested that the cancer, if it was that, might be at an advanced stage. Within hours, Walt was admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital, which was directly across the street from the studio, for exploratory surgery on his lung. The number of people who knew about Walt's actual condition was extremely small, likely not extending much, if at all, beyond family. Even though Walt's condition had changed from a damaged vertebra to cancer, the studio still released the prepared press release, which disguised the severity of Walt's condition. In the operating room, surgeons removed a part of his lung, hoping to excise all of the cancerous tissue. But they also noted that by this point, the cancer had metastasized, spreading to other regions of his body. 
With these factors, doctors gave him between six months and two years to live. In the days that followed, neither Walt nor his family used the word cancer. Instead, they used the term carcinoma, as though a slightly different name might alter the outcome. Even a casual fan of the Walt Disney animated features knew that good characters in a Disney movie often overcame death or near death to find happiness and a deeper love for those around them. This was true in Snow White, Pinocchio, Sleeping Beauty, and even in the feature that Walt was then developing, The Jungle Book. Hoping that the same might hold true for him, Walt told friends that he was, quote, gonna whip it. His nephew, Roy E. Disney, understood his actions for what they were, quote, there was a lot of denial about what it was, he recalled. Newness, no doubt through the network of his ex-operations people that now worked widely in the company, heard reports about Walt's condition, though they likely didn't know that Walt was being treated for cancer rather than for a damaged spine. Nunes did, however, know that on November 21st, Walt checked himself out of St. Joseph's and made his way to the studio where he talked to animators and discussed plans for the upcoming release of The Happiest Millionaire and Follow Me Boys, a live-action drama starring Fred McMurray. Walt also made his way to Glendale, where he met with lead designers including John Hench and Mark Davis. Walt, of course, didn't see Disneyland. It was too far away and too filled with people. Overall, the visit to the studio and to WED were, as Nunes could tell, good news. This level of activity made it appear as though Walt would recover from surgery and at least in some way regain leadership of the company. Quote, everybody was so amazed at how quick Walt came out of the hospital and got back to work at WED, Nunes remembered. He was calling meetings and talking about the future. But Nunes himself never saw Walt as he emerged from surgery. He never observed how much weight he had lost, how slow he moved, or the expression of exhaustion that now at times covered his face. According to Ron Miller, his son-in-law, Walt was hopeful that the surgery had fully removed the cancer and that he would soon be able to return to work. In the days leading up to Thanksgiving, Miller and other family members visited Walt in the afternoon. They might go out to dinner while Walt rested and then return in the evening for another chat. Quote, Walt was full of confidence, Miller explained. I think the thing that really helped him a great deal was a telegram that John Wayne had sent him when he heard that Walt had his lung removed, saying, welcome to the club. The meaning here was clear. Walt and the entire Disney family knew that John Wayne had been diagnosed with cancer two years earlier, in 1964, and also had his lung removed, but continued to live a relatively active life. On Thanksgiving morning, with the doctor's permission, Walt went to Ron and Diane's house for a traditional holiday dinner. Quote, he came to our house for Thanksgiving. Ron Miller explained, where the extended family watched home movies of a recent vacation the Disney family had made to Canada. Walt was supposed to return to the hospital that afternoon. But as his secretary, Lucille Martin, recalled, quote, it started raining and he didn't want to return. They called me from the hospital, she explained, and said Walt was supposed to be back at 4 p.m. and he wasn't back yet, and it was raining. I remember I had a call out to the house and say, the hospital wants him back as soon as possible. But he stayed a little longer. Ron Miller explained that he didn't go back to the hospital at all on Thanksgiving. Quote, the following day he went down to Palm Springs, Miller added. But Walt's temporary good feeling faded away, with the pain returning in force in his upper back and chest. Quote, at Sunday, he came back to the hospital. Hidden from the public and from most employees at the studio wed and the park, Walt's condition worsened. He still talked about the city he wanted to build in Florida and asked about the studio's newest film, Follow Me Boy, starring Fred McMurray. 
which had recently opened in New York. He spent his 65th birthday in the hospital, a day filled with family visitors. But he was growing increasingly concerned, even fearful, at the prospect of his own death. For his family, he appeared strong and hopeful, but at least one nurse recalled that Walt was increasingly afraid of what lay ahead. He died at 9.35 in the morning on December 15, 1966, in a hospital directly across the street from his studio. The official cause, cardiac arrest caused by lung cancer. The news came as a blow to most in the company. People cried, sat in their offices, and looked out the window, and talked about how surreal the moment seemed. The studio itself was utterly unprepared for his death, having only arranged a statement about his spinal surgery. Quote, I always resented the management of the company then, Marty Scalar said, because they knew that Walt was sick and they never prepared anything. Newness, who hadn't known the severity of Walt's condition, learned of his death while he was driving to work on the freeway. Quote, I'm on the Santa Ana freeway, he said, and I hear over the radio that Walt Disney just died. He pulled off the freeway, found a place to stop, and cried for a little while. But then he started his car and continued driving to the park. Once there, he walked up to his office where he phoned company vice president Card Walker. They discussed Walt's passing. Then Nunes said that he wasn't sure what they should do with the park that day. I think we should open, Nunes offered. That's what I planned to do. Walker explained that he needed to talk first with Walt's wife, now his widow, Lillian. Now let me get back to you. A few minutes later, Walker called Nunes to tell him to remain open. Not long after that, Nunes received another call, this time from Lillian herself. Dick, she said, you're doing exactly what Walt would want. From there, Nunes went out into the park to talk with cast members. Quote, Dick Nunes broke the news to Disneyland Park staff that Walt had died, one cast member recalled. Now, there were tears rolling down his cheeks as he told us. We were all in shock. Nunes directed that the flag be lowered to half-staff, then asked his team to do their best with guests, as Walt would want them to enjoy their visit. Cast members operated attractions, cooks prepared meals, musicians played their instruments. The park was only open for eight hours, but for many employees it seemed much longer. Shortly after 5 p.m., cast members again gathered at Town Square, circled around the pole where the flag remained at half-staff. They watched as security guards came out, lowered the flag, folding it lengthwise before folding it again in triangular sections, first the bars, then the blue, until all that remained were a few stars. During the retreat ceremony, the band typically played patriotic music, but that night, they played When You Wish Upon a Star, one of Walt's favorite songs, before launching into The Star-Spangled Banner. Many longtime cast members felt a surprising sense of loss that stayed with them for weeks, even as they moved through the Christmas holidays. For Nunes, though, the shock remained for months. As he understood how much of his professional life and identity had been connected to Walt. Nunes' sense of goals and even his ideals were, in many ways, an extension of those he received from Walt. Around him, projects initiated by Walt were still being developed. Over in New Orleans Square, the Wed Mapo team was installing and testing the pirate animatronics. Tomorrowland, by this point, was walled off to the public, with many areas now bare dirt as construction crews worked to build Walt's final vision of the future. But the creative remnants of Walt, as expressed in these projects, weren't enough for Nunes. At some point during these months, likely for his office, he searched for a photo of himself and Walt together. In his own materials, he couldn't find one. And then, a little later, 
He looked through materials at the studio. He couldn't find one there, either. It was odd, all that time spent together, now without a firm visual record. But at the moment, in the early months of 1967, there was a larger problem that faced the company than photographic proof of their friendship. Over the past two years, the company had purchased 27,000 acres of land in Florida, far from any major city, with the goal of creating a theme park, a resort area with hotels, and an outdoor recreation area. But this project would be nearly impossible to finish without Walt to solidify the relationship between Disney and various outside companies required to complete the project. Beyond this, Roy was concerned that without Walt, Wed wouldn't have sufficient leadership to engage a project of this size, as Wed had been Walt's domain, a set of buildings in Glendale that Roy himself had only visited two or three times. The company was at a crossroads. Without Walt, the company would need other individuals to bring Walt's ideas about film, entertainment design, project planning, and operations into the future. The company moving forward would be different than the company in the past, but the company needed individuals to arrange those ideas into new projects. There were directors who understood Walt's ideas about film and designers who understood his ideas about attractions. But as for managing the parks, making sure that day by day, they represented the moral environment of a Disney story, there was newness. For years, he had carefully listened to Walt's lessons, embracing them as part of his own thinking. Though he couldn't see it yet, he would have a unique role in the projects that lay ahead, projects that would have their own set of problems. I'll be back next week with two shorter episodes. That is, for the weeks around the D23 Expo, we're going to have a slightly different release schedule. One episode this coming week will explore what Disney is likely to announce at the Expo, and we'll run down projects that, even if they weren't announced, are possible for upcoming years. And in our other episode, we'll continue the story of Dick Nunes. So we should have an interesting week here some stories from the past, and some speculation about the future. And remember, our episode for the second week of September won't drop on Sunday night as usual, but will drop on Monday night, the day after the Expo, so we can explore all of the announcements and discuss what they mean. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Walt Disney Company. If you enjoy these episodes, you can support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until then, this is Todd James Pierce. <laughs>